I recently hosted a summit in Santa Monica, California to develop an anti-woke policy agenda for a potential future conservative administration. Uh, we had experts from all the different disciplines, people who had worked in previous White Houses, people who are working in state legislatures, and people who are really developing the agenda to turn anti-woke public sentiment into anti-woke public policy. And I'd like to share one of the most uh, uh, interesting takeaways that I had from the event. Um, and I'll start with the problem. Uh, one of the problems that we've had as conservatives is that we've ceded the moral language to the left to the point that you have even conservative political candidates using identity politics as their framework and as their pitch because it's really the most available moral lens. And so you have someone like Nikki Haley, who is an ambassador, a governor, a successful administrator, who is pitching her candidacy as, I am a minority female and hear me roar. What she doesn't know is that when you operate in your opponent's frame, you're guaranteed to lose. A conservative will never win in a battle of identity politics against the political left because they're setting all of the rules in terms of debate, and they're almost like a, a, a bank or a casino that, guess what? At the end of the day, the house always wins. This provides, though, an opportunity. And something that I really learned in discussion with a lot of people at this summit was that the anti-woke movement has reawakened the possibility for a conservative moral vocabulary. So let's look at it. In the past, conservatives really made their arguments at a statistical level. They said, well, here's the budget, here's the test scores, here's how the numbers are gonna work out at the end. But the new frame for many of the most successful people in this movement is through the language of values, to saying, hey, this is what we believe. This is who we're fighting for. This is what we want to see at the end of the day. So in other words, shifting away from a positivistic approach which prioritizes abstraction, mathematical formulas, and economic trade-offs, to a moral approach, which emphasizes values and people and ultimate ends. That's not to say that the former isn't important, we should think about those things, but it is to say that this new approach that foregrounds values and moral expressions is much more persuasive because it taps into human emotions and it lends itself towards human narratives. And what would this look like in practice? Well, I'd like to use two examples from this summit. First of all, um, school choice. School choice has been a conservative policy priority uh, dating back almost 70 years into Milton Friedman's early thinking. And the conservative argument for the last, say, 30 years was school choice is going to improve test scores, framing it as math and statistics. And then school choice is going to help improve outcomes for inner city minority kids, framing it as identity politics, saying this is really the discrete population group and demographic that we're trying to help. But school choice was really uh, not winning with those messages. There were some marginal victories, some small programs at the state level, but school choice using those arguments and frames never became a dominant public policy. Fast forward to the post-COVID world and school choice campaigners, such as my friend and colleague, Corey DeAngelis, shifted the narrative really completely Rather than emphasizing test scores and discrete demographics, the new generation of school choice activists made the argument about the curriculum, about the values, and they said rather than targeting discrete groups, we're going to actually offer universal school choice to everyone, really tapping into, most importantly, middle class sensibilities to say, hey, if you don't like what they're teaching in your school, if you don't want critical race theory, if you don't want gender ideology, if you don't want kind of COVID masking insanity, um, we're gonna offer everyone the school choice possibility. We're gonna let you take your money to any institution and find a place that reflects your values as parents, as a community, as an individual. And so what we saw that over the course of the last few years, the support for school choice um, really exploded. You saw huge support among the broad middle class, 
i.e. the people who really shift public opinion and therefore shift public policy. And then something really incredible happened. This campaign that had been building for 70 years with limited success, all of a sudden became immensely successful. You saw universal school choice legislation pass in 10 states with more certainly to come. The second example, the federal budget. Um, the traditional Reagan-style approach would be conservatives arguing for a balanced budget, arguing for spending cuts, arguing for tax reductions, and creating these really intricate mathematical and ec economic formulas to persuade voters on the basis of a abstract rationality. Um, we shouldn't really be surprised, though, that that doesn't get most voters excited, it doesn't get them inspired, it doesn't get them to demand action. But some people, most notably Russ Vaught, who is President Trump's former OMB director, have pioneered a new approach to talking about the budget that I think has enormous potential. Uh, Russ talks about the woke and weaponized bureaucracy. He talks about defunding $150 billion that is currently being spent to advance left-wing priorities that are antithetical to the values of the majority of citizens. And he's taking these uh, really complex mathematical equations and giving them a new valence, a new articulation using moral language. He's saying, you know what? We don't wanna defund the woke bureaucrats and DEI commissars who are putting critical race theory in all of the agencies of the government. And he's creating a, an emotional valence. He's creating also a narrative that uh, citizens through their legislators can go on the offensive and take out the woke and weaponized bureaucracy that is threatening the values of most people and the values of the American Constitution. And I think that this is gonna be much more persuasive in the future. And again, this is not to say that we should forget about the budget, we should forget about deficits, we should forget about tax policy. Those are important. But the way to get action, the way to get there substantively is through, first and foremost, this new moral frame. And so the ultimate style of communications, the ultimate approach to these issues is to combine both the economic or the rational argument and the values or principles-based argument. Um, so for example, when you're talking about the DEI bureaucracy, you should absolutely say that it's a waste of money that we shouldn't devote a single penny of taxpayer dollars towards advancing critical race theory in the federal government. But you also have to say that this is a moral argument, pitting a new neo-Marxist ideology against timeless and universal American principles. And when you can do both, I think that much more success for conservatives is possible. And at, at the end of the day, the moral argument taps into what Aristotle called the final cause, or the telos. Um, what are we doing these things for? What is the purpose of politics? What is the purpose of a sprawling federal government? And we're arguing that it shouldn't be squandered towards uh, an ideology based on resentment and revenge and, and redistribution, but an ideology or a timeless American principle based on excellence and merit and competence and achievement and protecting the values of the broad middle class. And when we can create the debate about ends, not just a debate about means, I think that we can seize the moral high ground and we can utilize this uh, vocabulary in a way we can reawaken a great conservative vocabulary to say that we are protecting people and their most deeply had values against a hostile and nihilistic bureaucracy that would love nothing more than to decimate them. And as we make that narrative, as we pull in school choice, we pull in the federal budget, we pull in DEI bureaucracies in public universities, all of a sudden we have a really powerful story to tell. We can rally people to the cause and we can point them towards a higher end, the pursuit of the true, the good, and the beautiful, or in an American context, the pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness that is gonna get people uh, inspired, get people motivated, and get people on board with a movement that has the possibility to make real meaningful changes uh, in everyone's lives.